Derby Talk, the show that tracks the Emmy race. And with us today, we have contender Joel McHale from Community. You've done okay on some award fronts, both of the TV critics groups, the, tele the TV mm. Critics' Choice Awards and the Television Critics of America have both nominated you for Best Comedy Series. You won Best Comedy Series from TV Guides, a fan-based awards, and there were several nominations you got at the People's Choice Awards. And at the Emmys, you actually won one. The, well, the one nomination you guys did get is the one you won. It was the Animation Award for what? Uh, Abed's, uh, uncontrollable Abed's Uncontrollable Christmas, right? Now, wait, what is this uh, People's Choice Award you're talking about? You got nominated there. Um, Betty White got nominated. That's right. What it was, Betty White got nominated. You that counts. Seven. Come on. I wouldn't put it past her that she would get several nominations in the same category because she is an unstoppable force. But let's talk about the most coveted award you've won so far, which was in 2010 the Gold Derby Award for Best Comedy Episode of the Year for, what was it, um, Chris, you remember, the Modern Warfare. Remember that Chris runs the Gold Derby Awards. Uh, take it away, Chris. Oh, yeah, Modern Warfare was by far the uh, selection of all of our posters that year. They, that was the first season, I believe. Yeah, it was first season, yes. Thank you. Uh, that was uh, directed by Justin Lin, and uh, it's, uh, boy, it, he directed the crap out of that, and uh, it was insanely well written, and it, it was a dream come true because I got to pretend to be an action hero. Um, the episode that they're talking about a lot this year so far uh, is Remedial Chaos Theory and um, and our Glee episode, uh, our Christmas episode that got a lot of uh, a lot of traction, as they say. What can you tell us about these up coming up? You alluded to them a few minutes ago. Well, the Law and Order one. Uh, I know that uh, Sony sent that out early because they were very excited about it. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have it yet, but um, it's basically uh, an homage to Sam Waterston and uh, that uh, the Dick Wolf uh, uh, world that he created. And um, and there's and I'm not joking, a lot of yams. <laughs> Uh, there's, and I'm not kidding, there's, there's more yams than you've ever, that I'm going to say, than this, other than maybe a farming documentary, you've never, ever seen more yams on network television, prime time, than you will when that episode airs. <laughs> Chris, what questions do you have for uh, Joel? Well, since you mentioned it, I don't know that it would be the greatest episode for you individually if you get nominated, but certainly that remedial chaos theory episode from earlier in the season, I think that was my favorite all of all the season so far. Tell us about that one and working on that one, because it was really inventive. Oh, well, that started in the mind of uh, our great creator, Dan Harmon, uh, of the creator of the show, not creator of the world. Um, and then I think Megan Gain no, uh, Chris McKenna is the writer on that one. He's tremendous. Uh, he just had a baby. Um, but uh, I think they wanted to do something like that movie Run, Lola, Run. And uh, for all of you that have seen that German movie, it is terrific. And um, it was one of those things that as we were shooting it, we were, we, I, I lost track of where we were. I hit my head so many times on that fan, which was the kickoff to each separate timeline. Uh, and um, it, I, we were always having to go, now what timeline are we in and what should we be thinking in this one? We got, a lot of us got confused. And as you can imagine, Chevy was confused most of the time anyway. <laughs> All right, we have I to ask you, Chevy. We have to ask you about Chevy. There's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going on and chatter in the blogosphere. That do you have any thoughts? Well, I um, as as you may or may not have seen in the last couple of weeks, I've been on a uh, personal. Uh, I like to call it my uh, I don't know what my whistle stop tour to uh, promote community uh, on every talk show that will allow me on and. Uh, yeah, so that whole voicemail thing came up, and um, so that was, I, I, it, I answered a heck of a lot of questions about it, um, but it came down to um, some things that happened at our cast party, and voicemails that were left, and that got recorded, and then broadcast, and um, it really was just a ruse to get people to watch the show, and that's why we beat American Idol last week. <laughs> oh, that's the secret. Okay, okay. Yeah, see? It's like the Kardashians. It's 
It doesn't matter. It's only good news if you're being talked about. But, you know, it is uh, difficult when you're on, on a show with these alpha dog uh, stars like Chevy. I'll, let's draw a parallel to 30 Rock. You know, Alec Baldwin very often gets prickly, very often gets uh, diva-ish, and threatens to leave the show, throws very public tantrums, and then he's back the following week, of course. And you guys uh, probably knew that, that Chevy could be a bit difficult. That, there were no secrets of what uh, he was up to at Saturday Night Live, but... Um, Looking down the line, is, uh, is, does he have much of a presence on the show? Of course, you've shot all the episodes for the rest of the season, right? Oh, yeah. No, he definitely has a presence in the show. I mean, no, no doubt. Uh, uh, he's all over the shows. And um, much to, sometimes to his, uh, uh, he, you know, sometimes he's like, come on, that, this is too much. Uh, but, uh, but most of the time he's very, you know, he's, he's, always, he's, he's there as much as, um, he's there. He's not as there as much as all of us, but uh, he's there a lot. Uh, so, um, I, and I, I wouldn't call Chevy an alpha dog. I would call him a karate dog, uh, <laughs> which was a movie he starred in, uh, straight to video, uh, with Simon Rex, 2004. Chris, you pile on here. What do, what do you have to say about all this? Well, I, you know, I'm a big fan of the show. Everybody on our website knows that. So, what's the, I mean, is the is the show going to be back for a season four? Have you heard anything? I'm going to make the announcement right here, right now, today on Golden Derby. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, no comedy yet has been picked up by NBC. So, uh, when it happens, I hope we are uh, part of that announcement. Uh, our ratings have been, um, you know, up and down since we've been back. I mean, uh, the first week back, we did beat American Idol in the demographic. Um, and uh, they have been up, and then they went way down, and they came back, yes, last week. Um, so it, uh, you know, like I think we, like we won, we won the night the first for NBC the first three weeks we were on. Last week, um, with the return of The Office, uh, we were definitely below them, but it's one of those things where it's a, I, and uh, Dan Harmon, I think, put it best in a Variety article that he was interviewed uh, for, where he, he likened that time slot to Vietnam <laughs> and said, uh, you know, uh, we just hope that the network uh, will hopefully see what, uh, you know, that it is a tough time to be and say, and say you know, thanks for... Uh, Thanks for being the beachhead there, um, and hopefully won't go. Hey, uh, we're going to try something else. So, um, so I thought that uh, Dan's analogy was really good. But how that do you how do you stomach good. the ups and downs of the whole thing? I mean, just six months ago, uh, it wasn't announced that you guys were even coming back, and there was this whole Facebook, Twitter campaign. I think there was even the threat of storming uh, of, of, of your fans storming Thirty Rock in New York to get this done. All of a sudden, you were. The, the announcement was made, you'll be back on the air in March, and you were, and, and it, that's got to be quite challenging to live through that. Uh, I remember Amy Poehler talking to us about that after the first year of Parks and Rec and just how unsettling it all is, but that's showbiz, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, these are, th these are high-class problems to have, uh, and uh, I mean, they're good problems, so you're worried, and so, you know, I count my blessings every day that I get to be on a show like Community. I'm thrilled by it. I mean, I, I, when, when we were in season, I mean, I skipped to work. Um, but, uh, yeah, being taken off, uh, uh, one of the, Amy's show, great show, Parks and Rec, uh, I always, we took a lot of solace in that and comfort in that because when they came back, they came back bigger and stronger than ever, and we have done part of that, uh, uh, so that, that was always kind of comforting and encouraging. Um, but so it is the, the waters of network television are, are absolutely unpredictable. And even when you think you have a sure thing going, um, such as something like, you know, two and a half men or something like that, then, you know, Charlie Sheen takes off. And so you just never know how it's all going to shake out. And, you know, I pray and hope that it comes back. Um, but there's there's literally nothing I can do by worrying about it, so I don't. So I want you to know, though, as you move forward to the Emmys, that I personally have lifted my curse against you at the Emmys because I've decided that bygones be bygones, uh, Joel, that uh, two years ago when you made fun of me on The Soup, 
I uh -huh. had I had not watched the episode, and I was walking into my apartment building in New York, and a couple of the doormen were going, "Ha ha 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 ha! Joel was teasing you on the soup tonight." And what you may remember that you did was uh, I had been on Good Morning America that day, and and they they had taken rather unflattering uh, camera angle of me for the interview, let shall we say, and you used it on that night's show uh, by introducing it as saying, "Poor Sigourney Weaver is obviously having a very bad day." Oh. <laughs> So, like, this is why we were never nominated. That's I right, right. Uh, but I am bigger than all of that, Joel. I hereby lift my curse. I want you to know that, that uh, I, I'm going to just not stand in the way anymore. Gold Derby's totally behind you. Wait, are you saying that you are bigger than Sigourney Weaver? <laughs> At the Emmys? Sure, sure. Well, I don't know. If Sigourney Weaver wanted to be on TV, I think she could make that happen. Well, uh, I, uh, I didn't realize my error, and um, if there's some sort of, uh, if I can send you a bouquet of wine, <laughs> okay. Uh, believe me, thank you for lifting your curse because uh, we uh, we we need all the uh, uncursed voters or uncursing voters that we can get. So uh, I didn't realize that, and it wasn't my fault, and that was not me. That was somebody else. <laughs> I swear. Chris, uh, Joel faces a, a kind of an interesting category here. Give us an overview of what's going on here because we have a couple of past winners. We've got Alec Baldwin and Jim Parsons who've won this, this race twice mm -hmm. before are there. Uh, and we have Larry David coming back and we've got John Cryer moving up from supporting. But yet there are some openings in this, in this race and there's this devoted fan base for your show. And what I think you contenders fail to appreciate sometimes when just looking at the science and the mathematics of how awards work is that you really don't need a lot of votes to get nominated. If you, how many are there in terms of uh, contenders in this race, 40 or 50? Well, if you have a good 7% of the vote, you get in, right, Chris? Absolutely. And, you know, you got rid of Steve Carell, so that's one slot that's open. Um, Matt LeBlanc, they didn't air any episodes this year, so that slot's open. Um, Johnny Galecki, we're not exactly sure how he got in last year, so that <laughs> slot you never know. Um, I mean, you, you got a really good shot here this year. Well, if I, I, I well, when it, when I don't get nominated and, and all I needed was seven percent of the vote, then boy, I'll, I'll I think I'm just going to jump off a bridge. That's great. But but I you're... did want to ask you as part of Tom's curse was that why you were in that Emmy musical group thing that was on stage last year? Oh, yeah, that was my payback to the audience. Uh, I wanted them to hear me sing. And no, uh, that that was a really good idea. <laughs> you all look so embarrassed. About, about the second time you all got up there on stage, it just seemed like you were all embarrassed. Um, it was, uh, yeah, it was one of those things where I, the LL Cool J saved it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was, I, uh, not, I probably am not going to be in a lot of barbershop quartets anytime soon. But the year before, the Jimmy Fallon Open was terrific. Uh, I, I fully was behind that. So I'm like, oh, great, let's do it again. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, I thought Jane Lynch was a really good host and a, obviously an insanely lovely person. So uh, I think she, uh, she made the whole night... Uh, uh, good. So uh, they didn't. They don't. They didn't have to. Uh, hopefully, people won't remember it too much. Uh, other than the people on Twitter who, uh, I'm going to say, uh, crucified me upside down for it. So that was that was great. But Joel, you hosted the Indie Spirits yourself, and I was there out in the uh, tent on the beach in Santa Monica. You did a great job. What was that like for you? That was great fun. Um, it was really fun, actually. I, I really, really enjoyed it, and. Yeah, uh, it was really nerve-wracking because you walk out there and you you got to get him with that opening monologue, and um, I I did it by just telling some really dirty jokes, and uh, and my parents were there, so um, which I then pointed out uh, after um, after the run of jokes, but uh, that ended up being really fun despite uh, the weather almost washing the entire award ceremony out to sea. Uh, that was uh, crazy. It was freezing. There was the night before. There was just rain pouring in all over every table, and things were shorting out. So uh, they really got it together. How I, how was this year? I, who hosted this year? Uh, oh gosh, Jeff Rogan. Yes. Oh, he, I'm that guy's great. I assume he was great. 
You didn't even watch this year? I have it recorded. <laughs> Chris, what other questions do you have for Joel? Give him some doozies. We've been, th we've been hurling softballs. Yeah, let me have it. Ask me something about, I don't know, the Iran nuclear situation or, or, or North Korea. Well, along those same lines, I was going to ask you about Jim Rash. Um, there you go. One of my other favorite episodes this year was Studies in Modern Movement, where you're blackmailed into spending the day with, with the dean, played by Jim Rash. I wanted to know a little bit about that episode, and also what's he like now that he has an Oscar? Well, I'll start with the first question, the last question first. He is a dick now. Um, no, uh, Jim, uh, he is uh, he's way too talented and, and with a combination of being way too cool and nice. It doesn't make any sense, and I, I'm, I, I resent him for it. No, but it, that episode was, let me start, well, well first, getting the, the Oscar was one of the most uh, coolest things him get. I mean, I burst out crying when he got it, and it was also with that leg thing he did, obviously, uh, some great press for community, so we, we ended up getting a great dovetail uh, press out of it, but I, I would, but that was, that's selfish, but his him winning that was just so cool. And one of the I couldn't believe. I mean, it was just like I, I was like I got like there's my friend Jim winning a freaking Oscar, and uh, I couldn't believe it. Um, but as far as the I, I, so I it, in it you, you hear that phrase it couldn't happen to a nicer guy. That is the phrase that phrase was invented for Jim Rash. Um, but his writing partner Nat, what a dick. No, uh, he's great. Um, so. Uh, but that episode uh, was really was really fun to make because I got to spend the whole week with Jim messing around, and the culmination of uh, of all the, all the different storylines coming together while we were singing uh, Seal's Kiss from a Rose was uh, well, it was really fun to shoot. But then seeing it all come together with everybody in different uh, singing in different places, including Chevy being just high out of his mind on paint fumes from painting Britta's apartment or Allison's, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Annie's apartment uh, was, I thought that was hilarious. And then, and then at the end of the song, when, when Jim's character is trying not to cry, made me laugh very, very hard. When you're doing uh, double duty and you're uh, shooting community at the same time you're doing the soup, what's your day like? How, how, how does it break down? You get up at a certain time, you go on the set for here or there, and then what time do you get over to E? How, how does that work? It's, uh, those days are always very busy. Uh, um, for, I get up probably around 5.30. Uh, depending upon the week, sometimes I go straight into um, the soup, but most of the time, or I guess it was about half and half, I would wake up, go to community, get my entire community makeup and hair done, then go over to E. Uh, let's see, from my house, Paramount is about 15 minutes away, 10 to 15 minutes, depending upon traffic. Then I'll drive over to E with traffic is about 15 to 20 minutes, so it's not too bad. Uh, I take the soup till about 10.30 or 11, and the night before I would have um, edited the script. Uh, and then at 11 or 10.30 uh, or 11, I call uh, into community and say I'm leaving now. And then they usually say, we're, we're waiting for you, or we'll be ready for you in half an hour. And, and then I spend the next 10 to probably the next 10 hours at, at community and then wake up and, and do it all again. I mean, I don't do, I only do the soup once a week, but those are the really busy days. But, but let me tell you, I mean, it's one of those things where uh, I am thrilled to be doing what I'm doing. So the, the energy, uh, the, the, the fact that I like what I'm doing really, I, I mean, I love what I'm doing. It really helps. It's kind of like when, you know, when you have a, uh, a child and people are like, well, how do you stay up all night? And you're like, I don't know. I just wanted to keep this thing alive. I really like the kid. Uh, so, um, so it has that same sort of energy where I'm like, well, I just enjoy what I, I'm doing. Even though I get really tired, I still kind of go, I think, you know, I, Thank God that I get to do what I'm doing. Dan Harmon has said that uh, you're great at improvising and that he, invi he invites you to do that on the show. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, Donald Glover, he says, too, is good at this and where sometimes the showrunners go, oh, please, please, uh, uh, you act, we write, but you're, you're a, uh, a talent that he appreciates there. How much uh, improvising have you done over the past couple seasons? Give us some examples. Wow. Um 
Well, one of the best examples, I mean, you first of, you've got you've got like Donald Glover and Jim Rash who are two of the best living improvisers on the planet. Uh, and I'm not I am not exaggerating and I challenge the people of Asia and Africa and Australia to uh, prove me wrong. Uh, no, um, but uh, let's boy. As far as a percentage goes, um, like doing "Kiss from a Rose," we had to improvise a bunch of stuff within that song. Uh, one of the best impro improvised lines was Donald uh, in a tag when um, they were doing Bert and Ernie. Uh, from Sesame Street, uh, uh, Danny Pudi, who plays Abed, was being Bert, and uh, Donald was was Ernie. And uh, no, split, no, no, that was right. And um, just at one point during the Im during the scene, uh, Donald looks at his watch and he goes, "Oh no, I'm late for my cousin's funeral," and um, that brought the entire stage apart. It was so funny. Um, but as far as percentage, the, the, the scripts are very, very they're dense scripts. So there's the jokes are packed in, and so you have to be able to, you have to get those out. You have to go, uh, you have to do that, but within that, there's a lot of improvising, and Dan, yeah, Dan is a collaborator, so he, you know, he, if, if you come up with something better, he's all for it, and, um, uh, but it, it's hard to, it's hard to, that, that's a rarity, because Dan is, you know, pretty damn good at what he does, so, Gosh, as far as a percentage, it would be hard to put that on there. Um, I don't know. Uh, I it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to say. It's just scene by scene. So I am rambling on. Talk about a bad improvise. I, I improvising. I'm doing that right now. So um, boy, I'll just stop talking. Ready? Yeah, and I'll and I'll I'll do the same, and I'll pass off to Chris. We'll both pass off to Chris here. Uh, what's your next question, Chris? Well, you've got uh, Seth MacFarlane, uh, first ever movie coming out this summer. It's uh, called Ted. What, what was it like working with him? What's this movie about? Uh, well, Seth is uh, a tremendous uh, guy, and he would be, uh, if he wasn't as crazily talented as he is, I would still want to be. No, I would still. He would still be one of those guys who are like, he's great. Let's hang around him because everyone likes him. Uh, but on top of that, he just happens to be a comedic genius, and and so it was, it was he's so great to work with. I know that you 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 rarely hear an actor go, that director was awful. But I really uh, uh, I really mean I mean I would I would follow I, I I would do any movie with that guy if he was directing a snuff film. I would be like, sounds good. Uh, so he's he's really great. He wrote this great script. He knew exactly what he had a great vision for what it was. So there was no ambiguity. He totally lets you improvise. I mean, we just improvised and improvised uh, for a lot from in many scenes, and um, it really shows you why he's so successful. Is because he's so good and yet so collaborative and. Um, He's just yeah he and as far as direction goes and you think he's a, the fact that he's a first time director is pretty amazing. Uh, obviously he's had a lot of experience from doing Family Guy and the live the live shows of Family Guy, but he uh, this is a, something that I think um, he'll he, I, I think the movie will do well and I think he's gonna if he wants can have a very long career of writing and directing movies. But the the movie is about um, a bear that uh, comes to life for an eight-year-old boy. And that eight-year-old boy is played by Mark Wahlberg. Not the eight-year-old. That would be an astonishing accomplishment. But um, uh, it starts out with a bear coming to life. This boy dreams and wants so badly for his bear to come to life. And it does. And it's, the be it's really like the beginning of a children's movie. And then fast forward 30 years later, the bear has ruined his life. The bear is insanely inappropriate. Um, uh, and I play I play uh, uh, the boss of Mark Wahlberg's girlfriend, who is played by the pretty good-looking Mila Kunis. Um, she's not bad-looking. And and uh, who else is in it? Like uh, um, Giovanni Ribisi, Patrick Warburton, uh, and uh, a bunch of other people that uh, Seth knows that are uh, really uh, you know really great. And it's just it. I am really excited for it to come out, and uh, it should be good from what people have seen in the screening. So it makes me very happy. Okay, last question for you here, uh, Joel. It always uh, surprises me that uh, 
when comedic talent uh, often wins an award, they decide to get very serious in their acceptance speech. So now you've been on the Emmy stage twice. You've been hosting the, in the Indie Spirit Awards. You're going to be act, actually uh, a much stronger contender, Chris and I think, this year at the Emmys. Let's say you win. Right. You're up at the podium. Are you going to go for uh, Susan Lucci tears? Are you going to go for the gag acceptance speech? Or are you going to pull out the list from your pocket? Oh, wow. I'm going to pull Susan Lucci out of my pocket. <laughs> and my pocket will be soaked with tears. And then she will then read the list of names of people I would like to thank. Uh, most of those are historical figures. So uh, I, it's going to go way back. Um, and, uh, and then I will not accept the award in protest. Uh, for what is happening in the beef industry with the pink sludge or goo or whatever that thing and stuff is. <laughs> uh, that'll what be do you think? The, I think it's pretty good. I think that uh, uh, Hollywood will certainly dig that big time. Yeah. Um, I actually think that Ty Burrell's speech last year was one of the greatest uh, Emmy or awards acceptance speeches I've ever seen. It was so funny and really uh, and poignant. It was just, it was perfect. And uh, for him to, I mean, just when you win, and then be able to just pull that out and be ready with that, oh my lord, I, I was, I, uh, I had to, I, I, I did not, not tip my hat, I got on my knees and did the, yes, uh, that, that was, was awesome. Well, I hope Ty Burrell did that to Chris Beecham at the end of that uh, Emmy ceremony, because if you watch the video at Gold Derby, it, between Chris and Ty last year, uh, you'll see their discussion of, Ty saying, well, I'm going to submit this following episode to the Emmy jury, and Chris going, no, 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 Ty, don't do that. Just submit this one instead, and of course he won. So uh, I want you to know that we will make Chris's uh, services available to you, Joel, when you get nominated this year, and we'll do what we can to help you out. All right, I'd like to submit uh, George Clooney's performance from The Descendants for <laughs> my Emmy reel. Is that possible? Maybe so, but he lost, remember? At the Oscars. Uh, but, but maybe he'd win the Emmy. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, I don't, well, all right, you're, okay. Uh, but I, Chris, I will, what I'm going to do, Chris, is call you after every episode, and I'll have about two hours worth of questions for you. <laughs> we'll do an analysis of each one. That sounds great. And then maybe I can end up on your wall behind you when <laughs> uh, some caricature from a TV guy from 1945. That's yeah, the Hall of Fame. the level of uh, Sid Caesar and uh, some of those guys back there, that's, that's when you make the wall. But oh, you're, right. You're first there. One and more season. And, and what this, wall in your house do you keep the people of the level of talent that I'm at? Like the, like the, like the, bath, the unfinished bathroom in the basement? <laughs> you actually signed a DVD for me a couple of years ago, and it's, it's right there in my, in my cabinet in the den. So oh. you know, you've got a place of honor. God damn. Bless you. Now I'm embarrassed. Look, now look. Look, he's already, he's won an Emmy in the time we've been doing <laughs> <laughs> This is, uh, what you have to do, Joel, is if you don't win any, you just buy them like I do. This is uh, Phil, oh. this is Phil Silver's uh, Emmy for Best Comedy Series 1956 for Sergeant Bilko. This cost me about $8,000 uh, at an auction. So, uh, look, I'm just saying they're al alternatives. Uh, Harvey Weinstein buys his Oscars, right? So they say, I believe, uh, it's not a bad strategy for Emmys, too. Well, I didn't realize Gold Derby paid so well. I got to get <laughs> one of these shows. Jesus. Well, Congratulations. That's what the Golden Gold Derby means, kiddo. I'm going to buy the uh, Emmy from uh, the uh, Perfect Strangers when it won. That's right. It swept that year, didn't it, Chris? Yeah, good luck finding those Emmys. <laughs> <laughs> Joel, thanks very much. It was good to have you on the air. Uh, Appreciate thanks, you. you guys. I I'm so sorry about uh, the delay and uh, about me not getting the camera working and about me not wearing pants right now uh, and uh, for, for being patient with me <laughs> at the beginning of this thing where uh, you should probably try, try to air that where it's just like, Joel, huh? What? No, why can't we? Why are you an idiot, Joel? Uh, and it's pretty clear. So thank you. We'll, we'll cover that all up in the edit room, not to worry. All right, Chris, I will be calling you. Okay, looking forward to it. Okay, cool. Okay, thanks, guys.